go ahead. Thank you. Um, I'm hoping you can all see my screen. Yeah, excellent. Um, yeah, so thank you ever so much for inviting me to talk today. Um, it's been fascinating already to see the links with other people's work and I'm really looking forward to seeing uh, all the other talks. Um, I'm going to try if I can to draw out what I've already noticed about the links, but um, I think it'll be great to, to talk. I will be available for the discussion at four. Um, it'll be nice to go into that in some more detail. Um, so yeah, I'm Michelle Kendall. I'm a postdoc at the University of Warwick. Um, I'm funded by the National Institute of Health Research um, in the Health Protection Research Unit in Genomics and Enabling Data, um, where I look at the impacts of interventions on outbreaks. Um, and I have an honorary contract with NHS Test and Trace for looking specifically at the impacts of the app. Um, so a very brief history then of the, the app, from my point of view at least. Um, first of all, just a general point, which I'm sure you all know, but uh, contact tracing is a well-established public health intervention with a long and interesting history, which I, I highly recommend a quick Wikipedia look at. Um, and in early 2020, it became clear to us, looking at that really early data from the Diamond Princess cruise ship and so on, um, that uh, the, the burden of transmission coming from people who didn't yet have symptoms was really high. Um, and that for contact tracing to play a role in, the, in combating the spread of COVID-19, it was going to have to be fast. It was going to have to be scalable to cope with lots of people getting COVID-19 at the same time. Um, and, and anonymous, by which I mean two things really. One, you need to be able to trace contacts for whom you don't necessarily have their name and contact details. And also, you know, if I test positive, um, if I'm concerned about uh, stigma or anything about the disease, it's nice for me to be able to notify people anonymously uh, that, that I'm infected. Um, and all of this suggested a role for digital contact tracing, which we, we published in Science in March 2020. Um, from there, pretty much straight away, the NHS COVID-19 app went into development and I joined a um, team of independent scientific advisors where we were then in the early stages answering questions like, should the contact tracing be triggered by uh, people's symptoms or by a positive test result? Um, should you look simply at first generation contacts or second generation contacts, those sort of questions. And as time has gone on, it's it's been um, adapting to, to the all the ways in which the epidemic has changed. Um, so the app was first trialed on the Isle of Wight in May of 2020. And we published um, a preliminary analysis of its impact there. Um, it was difficult to tease apart the uh, specific impact of the app um, from it, it was a, it was a launch of the whole test and trace service on the Isle of Wight. Um, it, it went really well, but the extent to which it was the app versus the positive advertising campaign or um, the availability of testing is hard to tease apart. Um, the app then became available to to everyone in England and Wales from the 24th of September 2020. Um, and an analysis which we published in Nature um, in early 2021 looked at the impact of the app in the autumn winter of 2020 and um, estimated that the app averted between three and 600,000 cases against a background of 1.9 million actual recorded cases. Um, I appreciate that's quite a wide <laughs> range um, and I'll come back to to that and, and how we estimated that later. Okay, um, before I go on in much more detail, I just want to make really clear sort of how I see the role of the contact tracing app. Some of this might seem really obvious, but um, I find that if I don't make all of this clear, um, we can run up against some misconceptions. So, so bear with me, um, I'm just going to try and explain We've got a whole toolkit of public health interventions available to us. Um, that toolkit has varied over time. Obviously, we didn't have vaccines to begin with. We do now. They're incredible. Um, the the um, public perception of um, 
each intervention can have a massive effect on how useful it is. And in particular, if you think about all the negative press surrounding the app in July of this year, when it was all about the pandemic, um, we saw a real uh, drop in the effectiveness of the app because of that negative press. So it really varies over time according to, to um, uh, how people feel about it. Um, then the actual relative impacts of these things vary over time. So Ellen alluded to this just now of how um, when you've got harsh lockdown restrictions and people aren't having many contacts, then there's not such a need for contact tracing. It doesn't add as much. Whereas when you've got a lot of freedom of movement, contact tracing actually adds quite a bit more. Um, and, and you can look at each any of those examples really and see how they they sort of interact. Um, the impacts also vary across all sorts of things. We, we see different levels of app uptake in different parts of the countries and, and across demographics. In fact, um, the app isn't available to people under the age of 16. And certainly in um, September, October of this year, a high proportion of cases were amongst under 16 year olds. So obviously the app doesn't have as much opportunity to work. Um, there's also a, a real interdependence between these interventions. Um, so what primarily springs to mind is uh, contact tracing is, is uh, certainly how we've got it set up here is that it's triggered by testing. Um, and so if you aren't getting the positive tests being registered, then it can't do so much. And conversely, if there's a lot of testing, so you're surge testing in a particular area, then there's a lot more opportunity for contact tracing to, to do its job. And, and then that the, the success or failure of one can lead to sort of less or more dependence on another. So I think perhaps the most obvious example of this is that since vaccine rollout, we haven't had to go back to another really harsh lockdown. And so when you're estimating the impact of vaccines, you, you want to be able to estimate the, the sort of counterfactual situation which would have happened without them. And that's really hard to do. Um, so I'm aware I'm making lots of excuses, but um, it, it is hard to estimate the individual impact of any one of these. Um, but the way I see it is that they, they all sort of chip away at the reproduction number R, some much more than others, um, and in a very time and, and situationally dependent way. Okay, so um, <laughs> my final excuse really is that it's hard to assess the impact of the app because it's privacy preserving by design. So this was one of the core things that was decided early on was that um, in order to drive high uptake, people needed to have confidence that it wasn't tracking the location, it wasn't tracking personal details. Um, and one of the things uh, which, it, well, it would help us if it did track, but I understand why it doesn't, is that um, you, you can, can see the number of positive tests on a certain day and the number of notifications on a certain day, but you can't link up who uh, potentially infected whom. Um, nevertheless, um, from the autumn winter data, we were able to estimate um, how many cases the app averted. And we did that in two different ways. So the first method, um, a modeling method, essentially looks at the number of notifications per day, looks at uh, what proportion of those notified were likely to be infected. And, and from there, tries to work out how many cases were were both sort of averted immediately and then because chains of transmission were broken how many people uh, weren't infected then during those three months and the other approach um, which which got pretty much um, double the estimate of cases averted um, was by uh, using a spatial comparison where you looked at the differences in app uptake by geography um, and controlled for factors such as urban or rural areas, um, uh, income deprivation measures. Um, and if you remember during that period, um, places were in different tiers of restrictions. And so we were able to match places on their sort of experience before the app and then see the added impact of the app. And that came out with an estimate of around 600,000 cases averted, central estimate of 600,000. Um, and I really, really hope to be able to share with you an update because we've we've been updating this um, 
analysis for, for the first year of the app. And unfortunately, the permissions for publication have been delayed. I'm really sorry about that. The best I can say is sort of watch this space. It ought to be any time now. Um, and if you follow me on Twitter, then um, I will draw your attention to it when it does become public. Um, so I am somewhat limited in what I can say today, but I hope I can make it interesting for you. Um, so the, the epidemiological impacts, sorry, the sun's really shining on my screen, I'm struggling. Um, so the app has <coughs> impacts in, in various different ways. There are some indirect effects, uh, which are things to do with like uh, being able to order tests more easily, more quickly, um, that helps with identifying cases and kicking off the contact tracing. Um, it allows access to information and all the different policy changes. Um, there, there must be behavioural effects. I would love to be able to um, talk to any of you who could give me some insights on how you could quantify these. But things like, I've got a family wedding in 10 days, maybe I'll have fewer social contacts in the 10 days leading up to it in order to make it less likely that I get pinged. Um, that's how I would think. I suspect many people would think I'll turn the app off for the 10 days before I go to the wedding so I don't get pinged. And I'm, I would love to know how people uh, preemptively change their behaviour because they know they've got the app or, or turn it off. Um, and, and there's a really interesting uh, network effect of the app, which is that it can quarantine people who aren't infected, um, but because of the up to 10 days they isolate, they actually then avoid being infected um, because the virus was actually circulating in their close contact network and that essentially the app alert just told them if you're prepared to isolate for a few days now is a really good time to do it and you avoid being infected altogether and um, so those are some indirect effects which we we have a go at estimating but for today today i'm going to mainly focus on the direct impact which is the people who are infected um, who are notified and they self-isolate because of that notification um, before realising another way, by which I mean before they lateral flowed or they got symptoms or for some other reason self-isolated. So that's the sort of specific and direct impact of the app. There are also broader effects. So uh, I think, as I mentioned earlier, for each case averted, you can imagine a, a transmission chain in the counterfactual scenario is, is broken and the onward effects of that. Um, and as I say, the, the higher the app's specific impact, um, the less reliance will be needed on other sort of less desirable tools from the toolkit um, in the extreme, uh, you know, avoiding lockdowns would be an incredible impact, but extremely hard to measure. Um, and, and finally, which I'll touch on just at the end, um, the app has been really useful for for real-time surveillance data, which is a, a slightly different epidemiological impact. So the direct effect of the app then. Um, essentially, the, the direct effect is proportional to the number of people who are being notified per positive test registered through the app. Um, and that's affected by sort of the sensitivity of the app and also national contact rates. Um, the proportion of those who are notified who are infected, the average fractional reduction in infectiousness upon being notified, which is a very wordy way of saying, do people actually change their behaviour at all when they're notified? Do they self-isolate, but they've still got a lot of household contacts, or are they able to, to completely self-isolate? Um, or now that the advice has changed, uh, do they go seek a test and, and follow the advice? Um, and finally, the, the fraction of the infectious period um, where the notification arrives so uh, ideally so if somebody gets infected and they start to become infectious you would like the notification to arrive in good time before they've become particularly infectious and before they would have realized another way that they were infectious so um, a quick summary then um, from some publicly available data of um, behaviours this year and how, how the app's been working. So the, these are available on a, a dashboard here um, using data from the, the public app stats which are here. And um, this is on a log scale and you can see that 
the main driver really of the number of positive tests entered into the app um, is the level of uh, virus around and the level of lockdown restrictions. You can see in particular that at step three we saw a really rapid increase in the number of positive tests being entered into the app and correspondingly a high number of app notifications. Um, here we have the, the number of notifications per index case. Um, it's really clear here that that absolutely increased very significantly straight after step three reopening um, and was in fact on its way down at the point when the negative press about the pandemic came around but that's just because there were so many positive cases around at that time. Um, I think it's interesting to compare the app to the um, contact tracing advisory service, the, the sort of more traditional uh, contact tracing, and just see how over time the um, relative um, uh, impact and, and relevance of each varies. In particular, you can see that uh, during April, May, as the Delta variant was emerging, there was enhanced contact tracing through the CTAS service, um, which was identifying more uh, uh, contacts per index case. Um, whereas in June, July, when things really ramped up, particularly during the Euros, then the app was able to keep up with the increased contact rates and, and notify more people. Um, and, and around now, they're, they're basically neck and neck. Um, you can also see the number of positive tests registered through the app as a proportion of national cases. And, and this um, reached a high of around 50% of all national uh, cases were going through the app in sort of June, July. Um, that really started to decrease after the negative press about the pandemic um, and decreased really rapidly um, a few weeks ago when a change was made to how the messaging came out when, when you were told that you were positive and given a code to register your positive test through the app. A change was made there and we saw an overnight drop uh, it has now been re reinstated and we're seeing things recovering again. Um, as I mentioned before, the app is actually only available to individuals aged 16 or over. So if we change the denominator of that measure to, to cases amongst the over 16s, um, we see that at, at its height, it was actually over 60% of all eligible tests were going through the app. Um, and the drop uh, that we experienced after the change in messaging was really significant. Um, but when we put all those things together, um, we can make estimates based on the number of notifications per day and the R rate at the time um, of how many cases the app is averting. So again, I'm having to revert to publicly available data, I'm afraid here. This is from a blog post from the 2nd of August um, where we were estimating the, the cumulative effect of cases averted during the Delta wave. And it as you would expect, massively depends on how well you think people adhere to um, the guidance of self-isolation. Um, the, there are ONS studies putting it between 60 and 80 percent, but we're not entirely sure um, how representative they are. OK, and I'm just hurrying a little for time, sorry, um, but I'll, I'll just end by talking about the real time surveillance data. So. Um, putting together all the information we get through the app, um, it, it, it is real time, essentially, the, the data packets are coming through from people's phones all the time, and there's not much delay on them. Um, and we're able from, from the information we get from the app to make an estimate of the R number specifically amongst app users before they test positive. Um, and that gives us an idea of national uh, sort of contact rates and, and how the virus is spreading. Um, and it works as a, a sort of leading indicator on the uh, national R rate. Um, so here you can see there was a dramatic drop in the, um, the R rate from the app, uh, which we saw when we published this blog on the 2nd of August. And it took like another uh, week or so before we could see that the, the national R rate followed that pattern. Um, there are uh, 
more recent and more interesting things I would love to say about this, but um, they, they'll have to wait for our next blog post, I'm afraid. Um, so, so watch this space on the coronavirus Fraser group, um, and I hope to be able to say more soon. Um, but yeah, I will stop there. Sorry, I've gone slightly over time, um, and I will stay around for the discussion if it's more helpful to do questions then. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, thanks for that great talk. Um, if there are any questions, please do raise your hands or leave them in the chat box. We can take a couple now and then um, some more in the discussion session. Yeah, I can't see any hands raised. Um, I'll wait a little bit to see if any... Oh, there we go. Okay, Ed, please do um, speak. Yes. Thanks, Michelle. That was really, 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 really nice talk. So again, this might be a, perhaps a broader level point, but so I guess you'll talk about basically having like this package of interventions and the fact that so the behavioral response is a complex high dimensional thing. And actually so intervention space is also this very high dimensional uh, thing as well. So it's a broader level point is, do we have the frameworks that can try and unpack this intertwined nature of or one intervention could impact the behavior towards another. And I guess with the app, in some sense, it's perhaps kind of like a novel intervention in that, in principle, we have an idealized view of how it might work. But this, I guess, is the first, perhaps one of the first instances it's got broad use. And so perhaps the general point is, I guess, could, is there any way to preempt what the behaviors might be towards these kind of new, new on-stream interventions? Um, guess, yeah. Yeah. Good question. Um, so at the same time, um, in sort of March, April 2020, um, others in the, the Fraser Group at Oxford, where I was at the time, were developing the Open ABM simulator to precisely to simulate the impact of interventions to try to get at that sort of question. Um, so I think there are things you can do um, sort of looking on short time scales, perhaps. Um, but when it comes to to wider um, assessments of the epidemic, like new variants are arising and things, it's very, very hard to start quantifying those things. And in fact, I noticed just the other day that the um, vaccinations people are, have stopped uh, publishing their estimates of cases averted because it gets simply too hard to to say that. So I'm not trying to compare us to vaccinations, but I, I feel like it's... Um, uh, a decent get out that if they're struggling, <laughs> we're all struggling. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, um, Ed, for your question.